with Alzheimer Speaks and for those of you who don't know me I am the founder and host of Alzheimer Speaks Radio. Uh, Alzheimer Speaks was started because my own mother lived with dementia for 30 years and I get the isolation, the frustration, the angst of not knowing what to do and how to do it and I, I, my goal with Alzheimer Speaks is to raise everyone's voice, bring us together, give us hope, and help us find that path of joy because it is there and I know it's there because I found it and so have many others. Today we are going to be talking about music and magic and engagement and uh, a program called the B Sharp Engagement Program which is out in Colorado and we are lucky enough to have Dr. Jenny Cross with us and our good friend, Cindy Lazinski, who is the founder of Dementia Friendly Communities of Northern Colorado. She has just done amazing things there, and we are gonna be talking with her and Dr. Cross about this B-Sharp program and the incredible results they have found through their studies. So can't wait to talk to them but before I go there we always get new listeners and so again for those of you that are new Alzheimer's Speaks is bottom line an advocacy based company providing multiple platforms to raise everyone's voice to share the stories of how to live graciously with the disease we also help companies expand their brand footprint and so if you're interested in marketing and branding opportunities, please reach out to me. Just go to alzheimerspeaks.com. There's a big contact button and um, give me a shout out. Now, before we start, I want to give a couple of shout outs myself to some of my favorite organizations. One is the Memory Cafe directory. Memory Cafes are helping people live graciously with a person in early to mid dementia and their care partners. They are all about building community, giving hope, finding joy, and you can find one nearest you by going to the memorycafedirectory.com, or maybe you're facilitating one, and if you're not in this directory, you're gonna wanna be in it's free. So again, go to memorycafedirectory.com for more information. And if you're interested in helping out with Alzheimer's research, you can do that by playing a video game called stall catchers so check out stallcatchers.com uh, people from 6 to 96 are playing this game and you can have dementia or not and it's just a fantastic way to contribute and help push alzheimer's research forward in a massive fashion people are um, doing competitions with schools, um, groups all around the world are participating. So check it out, try it. And if you like it, share it with your family and friends and, and get some more people um, interested in knowing about ways that they can help without costing any money, but spending some time. Uh, last I'm going to shout out to is Lisa uh, Marie Chirico, and she is doing her second annual cruise. And I highly recommend her dementia friendly crews over any of them that are out there right now. You know, we did one in 2017 and just haven't had an opportunity with busy schedules to do another. But I have full faith in, in Lisa Marie and what she's doing. She gets what it means to be dementia friendly and she is there to support and educate and make sure you have a great time. And they're going to be doing another cruise, I believe, in 2020 in March. You can find out more information by going to alzcruisetropics.com. That's alzcruisetropics.com. And I know you 
won't be disappointed at all. Last, I have to thank our audience. You guys are incredible. You have gotten Alzheimer's Speaks internationally known just by your likes, your clicks, and your shares. And I, I so appreciate your support. It means, the, it means the world to me and to my mom who started this whole thing. Uh, it's important for us to talk with people and share ideas at all levels and all stages all around the world because we are so much more alike than different. So again, please continue to like, click, share, subscribe, because there are people in your own sphere of influence that probably haven't come out and told you they are dealing with this situation. Um, every three seconds, somebody is developing dementia somewhere in the world. So this is something that can pull us together, can lift us up and give hope. So with no further ado, let me introduce you to Cindy hunt Lazinski, And she is an advanced practice registered nurse and the founder and executive director of the nonprofit organization, Dementia Friendly Communities of Northern Colorado. And I personally adore her. Um, she is doing such fantastic work, and she has one of the most energized and progressive dementia-friendly communities, I believe, in the United States. Cindy also is an accredited speckle coach in North America. She's the only speckle coach, which is pretty cool, through the Contented Dementia Trust in England. And speckle stands for Specialized Early Care for Alzheimer's which is a counterintuitive person-centered care approach aimed at providing lifelong well-being for people living with dementia. Cindy started the dementia-friendly community in Colorado about four years ago, and the momentum has just, it's, it's on a crazy high level. I, I just, the energy there is just spectacular. And she um, has been involved with the B-Sharp Arts Engagement Program, which is really going to be the focus of our talk today. Uh, Cindy was also part of the collaborative team, which started this program, and they have offered it to 30 couples living with dementia um, in Fort Collins with their Symphony um, Masterworks performance. And they've been doing this for five seasons, and they are working with the Colorado State University, examining the experience of participants. And as you will hear from Cindy, she is just a head passionate about helping people discover that there's a lot of great living to be done and joy to be shared, even when uh, someone is on this, this path of dementia. So welcome, Cindy. How are you doing today? Thanks. Good. I'm enjoying the snow in Colorado. Yeah, you guys are really getting dumped on and it's coming our way. And yeah. so we, we are preparing in Minnesota. They're up to probably 10 to 14 inches now is what they're saying. It started at maybe zero to two. And so um, it's significantly changed, but I think we're kind of looking forward to it. I, I know yeah. I am. I, I love the, the holidays. Yeah, exactly. So now with Cindy, um, we are also joined with Dr. Jenny Cross, uh, and she is the principal researcher for, uh, for the team of the B-Sharp Engagement Project. She is a community sociologist who works with community groups to create and access programs designed to improve community well-being. So so welcome, Dr. Cross. How are you doing? I am doing great. I'm really pleased to be here with you and Cindy and talking about this really fun community-initiated program. It is very, very cool. Now, to start out, I always ask my guests first if they've been touched personally in their own circle of family or friends by dementia. So, Dr. Cross, um, how about you? Have you been personally touched? Yes, my great uncle, James Thompson, who was a veteran of the world war he had dementia in his later years and it was just really heartbreaking for the whole family he was a rose gardener and a master gardener he'd been the county clerk here and so he was a really well-known character and community and it was 
really a struggle for us to see him not remember people and not be able to do the things that he used to do. So that was the first person that I knew uh, with dementia was someone of my grandparents' generation. Thank you. And Cindy, how about you? Well, I got interested in dementia primarily because my dad reported some symptoms to me that he was noticing. And um, I was working as a geriatric community case management nurse at the time. So it's not like dementia was new to me. But as soon as your own dad reports the symptoms, <laughs> everything changes. So that's when I really did get passionate about learning whatever I could about dementia and try now um, to use what I learned with my dad to work with people in the community here in Northern Colorado. Yeah, playing it forward, I think is so yeah. important. And it's one of the things that um, I think resonates with most everybody who steps into this, you know, when they've been personally touched, you know, they they just want to push, you know, what they know to make the make the journey easier for the next next person. Now, Cindy, you started, as I said in the opening, the dementia friendly community of Northern Colorado like four years ago. And you became part of the Purple Angel movement and are an ambassador uh, for that, which Norms McNamara started. So tell us how you've gone from this volunteer initiative to a solid nonprofit organization that's recognized now by the Better Business Bureau and is an accredited charity in just four years. Because I think so many out there, you know, start out on this volunteer basis and go, you know, how do we make this sustainable? How do we make this work? So open up, tell us your secrets. Okay. Well, it's not easy. <laughs> and we started as a volunteer initiative uh, just because I was doing memory cafes with another friend of mine in town. We had a support group for care partners and then got I got pulled into this B Sharp Arts Engagement Program, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But the momentum was so high for that particular program in our communities that we thought, well, what's next after this arts engagement program? And that is when we launched into the whole idea of a whole dementia-friendly community. We ended up moving from our memory cafes and our support groups to trying to train businesses out in the community. And then from there, even our education expanded more into, well, we also need to be training our senior professional organizations and healthcare and doing more care partner education. So we've been doing a lot of that. But I also think that we're not afraid to leverage what other people are doing so that um, our community knows we're a collaborative organization and what we do actually helps them look better. Um, one of our projects has been patient resource folders that we get into the neurology offices, internal medicine and family practice offices throughout Northern Colorado. And we have our resources in those packages for people that are uh, first getting diagnosed. But it doesn't just have dementia friendly communities information. It also does have other organizations information in there. And so that helps them get more referrals and it helps people get connected right away to so many resources that they need. So I feel like we're all helping each other. And if you don't care who gets the credit, you can get more done. So I do feel like that's probably the secret to our success here. I would totally agree with you on that. That's what we've done in uh, Roseville, Minnesota too. Because people, it, there's, this, uh, there's this fear or this standard that they're my people and I don't want to share them because what if I lose them because I need them to do my job and stuff. And so we really, you know, started referring people out to different things. And then the fear wasn't so great to refer back. And again, to not try to reproduce what somebody's doing, but really share. So you just, you cover much more territory. It's, and it's healthier for the families. And I think for the businesses, much, much effective in that way. Um, I'm going to go to Jenny next and just um, ask you first, in terms of this program, you, um, you've been doing it now for about, what, four or five um, seasons. So what was, kind of give us some background as to the program, how did it get started, and, and um, who reached out to who first? Okay, 
So uh, the program itself is really interesting because it's really a great example of a community initiated program that it was a group of people in the city that were really interested. So Banner Health is one of the local health care providers and they were a signature sponsor of the Fort Collins Symphony in 2015. And they really said, you know, we'd like to do more than just sponsor the symphony. We'd like to see if we can really start a program that would do something. And the Banner Foundation in Phoenix had been supporting a similar arts engagement program. And so the people at Banner are the ones that brought the idea to Fort Collins. And they started a steering committee. And that steering committee consisted of representatives from a variety of community organizations, including Banner Health. So the Fort Collins Symphony and the Larimer County Office on Aging, and the local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And we have, um, Banner has an adult um, daycare program called Stepping Stones, and so they were involved. Um, and then at some point, Cindy was asked to join the group, and uh, she'll have to explain how, wh at what point she was invited. But So think about that was a group of people, all of the local organizations, you know, the County and Alzheimer's Association and adult day programs that were offering services to people with dementia and their care partners. And then they were partnering with the symphony and then also with this larger health organization. And collectively, they said, let's try to create um, a more inclusive program and something that is actually really improving both the health of um, people with dementia and the quality of life of people with dementia and their care partners. So that's how the program began with all those community agencies saying, let's see what we can create for our community. Wow, that is really cool. So Cindy, uh, how, did you, how did you end up getting involved then? Someone got word that we had been doing some support groups and memory cafes. And really, I think we were the first group to have a memory cafe. Um, and of course that's expanded now to where we have seven throughout Northern Colorado. Plus we do like mobile memory cafes in long-term care communities. Um, but back then it was just one. And because I was working so closely with people in the community through the age friendly community initiative and through Alzheimer's association, they just kind of pulled me in. And um, it was before we were actually even a volunteer initiative of dementia friendly communities. So that actually the, the dementia friendly communities initiative launched from the B Sharp Arts Engagement Program just because there was so much energy behind supporting the people that were participating in the B Sharp program. Well, very cool. I gotta ask you, what is a mobile memory cafe? Uh, so our uh, memory cafe kind of coordinator person has decided to take the themes that we have at all of our memory cafes and bring them to long-term care communities for people in later stages of dementia, where they do similar reminiscing and similar activities. But again, regardless of the theme, we always say our agenda is joy. And so my friend Andrea has been going to about 25 different long-term care communities and offering those cafes in, in those communities. Well, that's pretty dang cool. I, I, I love that idea. Um, Jenny, did you have a, a personal interest? Were you really drawn into this when you heard about it? Or, or was it just another research project for you? So this, I think, is actually a really interesting story. So you introduced me as a community sociologist, and all of the research I do is bringing the tools of sociology and other social science to our community partners, helping them to answer community problems. And so I was approached by a member of the board of the Fort Collins Symphony who knows me and knows all the community-based research I've done. And she said, hey, Jenny, why don't you come listen to our group and see whether or not you're interested in doing research and whether or not you think you can find other CSU researchers. Because that steering committee that organized the program, they said, you know, we can be so much more effective if we are really engaging with CSU. They're an asset here in our community, we should be working with CSU. So I went to one of their meetings and I said yes for two reasons. Number one, I make a choice about all the research programs that I work on and I just ask myself this question, is it an important question to answer? And so if we take people with dementia and their care partners to the symphony, 
and we want to know if it improves their health and their well-being and their sense of social connectedness, is that a question worth answering? And the answer to that is, of course, yes, especially when you're a community sociologist and you care about the quality of people's social relationships. And dementia is, you know, such a frustrating disease for families because it really erodes the quality of people's social connections. And then we know those health outcomes for care partners are the result of all of the stress that's put on them that makes it difficult for them to maintain relationships and work. And so if we can do things that improve quality of life for those pairs, we're improving the quality of life for our whole community. So I said yes for that reason. Then the second question I ask is, is sociologists the right set of tools? And in this case, we are the right set for some of the questions, but not everything. So I had to go find other researchers who would be interested in examining this. And um, one, one of the toughest things is that this is a degenerative disease. And so knowing that we would actually be able to measure any kind of positive outcomes over the course of nine months, which is a symphony season, when we started collecting data, that was really uncertain. There was no certainty that we were going to find good news. And how would we interpret the data if we didn't really see, you know, kind of an increase in anything in particular? So some of the researchers I first approached at CSU and I said, would you like to join me in assessing this program and seeing if it makes a difference? They said, well, a program like that has no hope of making a difference. And I'm kind of a stubborn human being. And I just really believe that this project needed to be studied. So I kept knocking on doors until I found Dr. Michael Taup, who is um, a well-known music therapist. And he said, well, even if we can't see progress over nine months, I bet we can see progress in a therapeutic sense over shorter intervals around the period each week around the symphony. And we really ought to investigate that. So I'm in. And he happened to know a woman in the uh, psychology department, Dr. Deanna Davalos, and she does um, most of her work with um, an aging population and with people with dementia. So she is the director of the Clinic on Aging at Colorado State University. And so she knew what the right tools were to really assess cognitive performance and to understand um, brain health in, in both of these groups. And so when um, Dr. Tout and Dr. Davos got on board, then we finally had a team um, of scientists that could really study the variety of impacts of this program. Well, that had to be exciting to just find those right matches when you've got people with passion behind the, the project. And um, it must also be fun too, to see the results, to just be able to share them and go, it is working. You know, and we'll we'll get into those details a little bit more. But I want to ask Cindy in terms of your interest in terms of working with this program. What were your first thoughts? Well, my first thoughts were that we loved using music at our memory cafes anyway. So we I thought this would just be interesting to see how the symphony did affect folks that were attending. Um, and probably my bigger interest was have the receptions that we offer before the symphony performances, because that's more my, you know, I care more about, it's more like a memory cafe atmosphere, but it's this social gathering that we have for people that are part of the B-Sharp program. And we, you know, have snacks and visiting, and it's while the, the people living with dementia are going through some of the assessments before the symphony, and then they would also come back at intermission or at the end as well. So my piece of it was more the interest in what's going on with the visiting during the receptions while all those other researchers were doing the hard work. <laughs> gotcha. Now I, I have a question because I want to find out about the, the study itself and I'm going to direct this one to uh, Dr. Cross and that is was it just the person with dementia that was evaluated or was there a care partner evaluated because I think that that would be really interesting to see how they're doing. So the study was always conceived of trying to improve three big outcomes though so the um, cognitive health of people with dementia. So we've been doing cognitive tests on the people with dementia. 
We have not been doing them on care partners, but this year we're starting to expand the group of people that we're studying, and we are now starting to um, do some of those measurements on um, volunteers who want to participate in the study who have not don't have any kind of um, diagnosis of dementia. Then the second piece we really were interested in is the quality of the relationships between the care partner and people with dementia. When I read the transcripts and the research reports from the Phoenix program, um, the arts engagement program there, I really noticed that some of the comments were about how people were relating to each other and sharing memories. And that's what got me thinking about the importance of capturing that data of how people are relating and connecting to each other as pairs. And then the third part was thinking about, for care partners in particular, how the program is influencing their sense of social connectedness and support um, from the community because dementia can tend to be isolating for care partners as well as people with dementia. Wonderful. Well, let's get into finding out some of your key results in those, in those areas. Okay. So the first news, and this um, research has finally made it into academic publication. It takes years. <laughs> so the first year of data is now in an academic journal article, and Laura, I'll send that to you and share it with you so that you can post a link for people who might be interested. The first data on that showed that uh, people who participated in multiple events over the first year actually demonstrated um, an improvement in their cognitive function on these kind of rigorous uh, clinical tests that measure people's cognitive health. So the test we're using called the R-bands is designed to take repeated measures over time. And it's also designed to measure several dimensions, several different aspects of cognitive performance. And it's designed to measure them over the whole spectrum from um, healthy aging to people with dementia. So that's uh, why Dr. Davalos chose that instrument. And we were quite honestly stunned to see that the biggest changes we saw were over that nine month period. They weren't from before a concert to after a concert. They were actually for people over the whole um, season that we actually saw a cognitive improvement in the majority of pairs. So about 75% of the people that took it over time and that we had repeated measures on, all of them showed um, a measurable improvement. And that's really stunning. As I said before, these are people who have um, a degenerative disease, and so we would expect their scores to be going down over nine months. Often, when you're studying a population like this and you're doing an intervention, what you hope for a positive result from the intervention is to keep their performance flat. And that if it's flat, you assume that that's actually an improvement over what would be degeneration. So we don't know exactly, precisely what is responsible for that. And there are lots of things that could be responsible. One is that the choice to become engaged in a program like B-Sharp also encouraged people to take other actions during their time to, because they have more hope that they could be living well with dementia, that they're not just going to the symphony, but they're also looking for other opportunities to be engaged. It could be that it's just the music. It could be that it's the combination of the music and the social environment. It could be that it's the combination of music and a social environment and that they're just getting much more physical activity. In the third season, we started giving people um, Fitbits. And so a few, of, a few pairs have been wearing Fitbits. And we see that on days that they attend the symphony, their general physical activity level is much higher. We all know that physical activity is good for our health and well-being. And so our study doesn't have large enough numbers for us to isolate all those separate influences and factors and to say, oh, it's just this one thing or it's really the quality of the music. We can just say that there's something about the comprehensive nature of this program that is making a difference for people. Well, that is amazing, um, and and yet to me, um, not so much because I'm a firm believer when people feel purposeful. Um, and to me, all of the areas that you mentioned in terms of hope and you know helping out the next guy in in terms of doing something about the disease, I think all of those things go hand in hand. And I I hear that from people living with the disease all the time and when they feel purposeful, 
they have more quality of life, they're more engaged, they, you know, they want to do more. Um, so to me, and again, I'm by no stretch a scientist, uh, to me, that would be what's pushing everything is this sense of belonging, especially when it's long term like that. Cindy, what, what are your thoughts on uh, these results are fantastic. They are. And I think uh, Jenny has some interesting um, ideas about the idea of reciprocity and how important that was for care partners particularly. But even like you said, just the idea of what I'm going through is going to count for a greater good. And that does give people purpose. But Jenny, you you have more um, insight into that whole idea of reciprocity with this study, don't you? Yeah. So this is one of the things I learned that I really was surprised by, mostly because it really stoked my curiosity. So cognitive uh, psychologists and social psychologists and communication specialists and sociologists, all of them study relationships. And they look at how our relationships influence the body and our mood and our minds and one of the things that we think about in relationships is this idea of reciprocity that I am sharing with you and you're also sharing with me and so the care partners talks to us about their experience that a few kind of things that are all clustered together one is that coming to the symphony when they are also going to have this social event allows them to give and receive support from other care partners. And they're able to do that in what they call a normal social setting. And that normal social setting isn't like we came here to whine and grumble and be depressed about how hard it is to be, to be living with someone with dementia. Rather, they're able to just be at a social event and say, hey, how are you doing? How's it going? What are your challenges? And maybe you want to get support about dementia, or maybe you just want to socialize and talk about what's going on. So um, that's one of the first things we learned is um, people talk about that normal setting. The other piece, though, is that they really talked about the importance of being able to give support to other folks. And that is what surprised me, because we think about people who are caring for others as spending too much time giving and not enough time receiving. So you kind of think that what you're going to hear is, oh, they're going to say it was so important that I got to receive support from other folks. But that's not what they were saying. They kept saying it's really important for me to give. And I thought, what is that about? And so then I started thinking about it and looking at the literature and the science on this, and I realized that it's about restoring reciprocity. So that for people who are in a caregiving relationship, all of their relationships have changed and become less reciprocal. So they're giving to their partner in lots of ways and they're not receiving in kind in the ways they used to. Now they also have to ask for all kinds of people in their social network, their kids, their friends, their family, their colleagues. They need more support, so they're asking. So they have these two really uneven relationships with the person with dementia they're giving and with other people they're having to ask a lot. So they're in the middle of these relationships where it's not really even and reciprocal. What's important for them with other care partners is that it becomes more reciprocal. And even though they describe it in terms of, oh, I'm able to give support and it's really meaningful for me to share what I know and my experience with others. I have a hunch that it's actually as much about that reciprocity that they're receiving and giving, and it restores the balance that we all crave in relationships. I guess I would add to that in terms of, um, to me, it, it kind of goes back to even using the word care partner versus caregiving that sets people up to say, I'm giving it all away. There's nothing I can get back from this relationship. And we all know that it feels good to give. And when you are giving back to your community, I just think that, I mean, I see it all the time in the Memory Cafe, Cindy, I'm sure you do as well. People love to give a hand up. They love learning from one another through all the different stages and things that they're going through and being able to feel comfortable and safe. Um, and again, like you said, getting back to that normal. But I, I think sometimes we undervalue, and it's one of the things that I try to teach when I'm out there, 
in terms of people asking for help is we all know how good it feels to help somebody. And we are taking that away from people by not asking for help. And so when they can give back, you know, what they've learned and shared, because they know what it's like on that other side, being lost and floundering. And so to me, it's just a, a it's a natural yin and a yang, but sometimes people get so consumed. I know I did as a daughter caring for my mom. I was just so focused and, and my world got really, really small. And when you, you know, take that can opener and you kind of pry it open and go, oh, there's others in here, just like me, and you find your new normal. And I think, you know, we all know dementia isn't normal, but it is a new normal for many, many families and communities and adjusting to that. Cindy, I see you kind of bopping your head. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. My thoughts on that is it, it occurred to me while you were talking, Jenny, that the whole idea of that reciprocal need to give and take um, fits with what we're doing with our memory cafes in December in that it, instead of our Christmas party gathering, we're going to actually use that time to make homeless kits for um, people to have in their cars, you know, to, to give out to folks. And it's just that idea of it's, it doesn't have to be all about us and what we're going through walking this dementia journey. We still are able to give out to the community. So part of our Christmas party is going to be making those kits. And I think that's just another example of I still can give and make a difference. Well, and I think that that's perfect, Cindy, because to me, the Memory Cafe is about dementia pulls everyone together, but it kind of takes a back seat. It is about fun and joy and camaraderie and doing all the normal stuff, maybe a little bit different, but still getting out there and doing it. And so that only makes sense to, to give back. Um, yeah. Because to, to me, that makes it even more normal. Jenny, is, does any of this make sense in terms of, of what we're saying? Well, it does. You know, positive psychologists have been for years really studying um, and articulating what they call a theory of human thriving. And one of the things that is part of human thriving is having positive emotions. So memory cafes are about joy. So that's the first one. And um, having positive relationships. And so that's what people, the care partners talk about all the time is that being at the B Sharp Arts Engagement gives them the opportunity to have positive relationships both with their loved one and with other care partners. And then um, another important thing is for human thriving is a sense of meaning, that we are participating and contributing to something that is larger than ourselves. And so that's why it's meaningful, even for people with dementia who might be really frustrated by the cognitive tests. These tests are not fun to take, you know, they're, they're hard. And the more dementia you have, the more you fail. But the reason that people are willing to keep doing it, you know, um, symphony after symphony is because they really feel like they're contributing um, to something bigger. So participating in something that's meaningful, both for people that you know, the other care partners that you see there, and something more meaningful to the whole agenda is something that is really at place um, for everyone. And we're really missing an opportunity if we are if we think only about people that um, are care partners, if we're so worried that they're kind of tapped out by caring that we shouldn't ask them to do any more caring, we are really missing that opportunity, that human need to um, be contributing to the world. And that, you know, sometimes you might be tired and frustrated by your caregiving role, but that doesn't mean that you don't actually want to be helping and supporting a variety of other people. And so to me, that was the aha that pushed me to um, really think more critically about what the role of social support looks like um, for everybody who is living with family members who have dementia. I love that because I think when you give, you can get filled. And, and sometimes we, we have this set mindset that it only goes one way. And I think that's something that we strongly have to educate people on is, you know, that, that getting filled back up. And, and that is 
um, a friend of mine over in Australia, Daniela Greenwood, she, she talks about everybody has the right to citizenship and they shouldn't lose any of their rights to participate. And I just, I loved that saying because it's hitting all of the levels that you're talking about. And um, yeah, they might have to be adapted but it's still, you know, people with dementia want to give back. I mean, that's, I, I, I don't think I've met a person with dementia who hasn't said that they, they're looking for ways to be able to give back. So, you know, to be able to be in a study that's fun to boot, you know, and entertainment and social engagement, I mean, like, who the heck's not going to sign up for that? And, you know, for their care partners to be able to have that extra ring of support and, and getting benefits if that's studied or not, which I, I think would be great to, to hone that all in, I think is brilliant. Dr. Cross, what have you seen in terms of the you know, community impact from the study? We've kind of talked about participants. Have you seen a change in community impact? Yeah. <laughs> So Cindy really talked about how the dementia-friendly communities as an organization, they're really doing what um, public health professionals would call comprehensive plan planning, comprehensive prevention, which is that they're working with all those different layers, right? They're giving the folders out to um, doctor's offices so that people have resources. They are training businesses. They are doing work and specific professional development in the residential treatment programs. So the dementia friendly communities over the last five years in the course of C-Sharp has really expanded what it's doing more broadly. So that's one piece about how the community has changed is that this was really a catalyst for us thinking about and talking about what's that broad set of work that we're doing. And then, so related to this, the Lincoln Center, which is our local performing arts, arts um, venue, um, they were one of the first to go through the dementia-friendly training for people. And I know that they take their job really seriously because I was at one of the symphony performances and every year I give a lecture um, before the November concert. And my husband was joining me later and I couldn't find him and I'd seen him walk in and he walked down the hall. So I went up to one of the docents and I said, hey, I'm looking for my husband. He's wearing this you know, red and blue plaid shirt, and he looks lost. I'm trying to find him. And the woman grabbed my hand and she said, oh, does he have dementia? Let me help you find him. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, he doesn't have dementia. He just looks lost all the time. So I know that um, just at our venue, that it's totally safe for anybody, a normal person like me or someone with dementia to say, I can't find my person, and they're going to take really seriously how to help. On top of that, at the beginning of every symphony performance, the chairman of the head of the board of the symphony comes out on a stage before the symphony begins and, you know, thanks people for being there and talks about whatever else is kind of important and on the board's agenda. But then before the concert begins, they remind the audience about the B-Sharp program and that all of the cost of tickets is paid for as a donation every year um, by local patrons. And because we're saying it out loud in front of everyone, you know that there are other people in the audience who have dementia in addition to the people that are B-Sharp participants. And so I have people calling me that are you know, in my social networks in various places, and they say, oh, I heard about the B-Sharp program at the symphony. My mom's really interested. People are asking me for other things all the time. And so at the end of the first season, we really heard the B-Sharp participants say, I feel very supported by the community, that we know that this program is funded by local community members. It makes me feel that the community understands and is aware of dementia, and that they care enough about me to, to pay for this. And I hear it spilling over. And so if other communities are thinking about doing this, it's not just about hosting it, it's also about where are all the venues that we talk about it? Where do we ask for support and where do we remind people that doing this work matters and is important. But that it makes so much sense. And I, I love the piece about your husband because I'm a firm believer that what's good for dementia is good 
for every aspect of our life. And to me, that just proved it, you know, and uh, Cindy, I want to talk to you in terms of the impact that you've seen um, on the community itself. You know, I, I think it's just increased the awareness that people can live well and that they can be part of our general community. And all it takes is for us to learn simple strategies and techniques to help people stay socially engaged. It's not rocket science. It's just awareness and compassion. That's really all it is. And I, I just think, you know, the stories that we get to hear of couples, or even when I got to sit in on one of the symphonies and I watched one of the couples in front of me who had been married more than 50 years and they were holding hands and keeping beat to the music. And one of the care partners described it as it felt like soul travel. Um, so I just, you know, I just love that, that there's still meaningful connection for the couples together. There's meaningful connection with the couples and the rest of the community. And then for those of us that are just kind of on the outside making this project go, um, I, it just enriches our lives as well. Oh, I agree. And I, I do think, you know, having those conversations and making it normal, non-threatening, and, you know, people are, are not scared to talk about it. They're proud to talk about it. And, and to me, that's just such a huge shift in, and has to be one of the focuses to me of any dementia friendly group. It's about removing the fear. It's not adding to it. It's not making it scarier, but it really is creating these, these new normals where, you know, they can have fun, they can relax, and they can live graciously together. I think that's one of the key differences in terms of, um, you know, is it going to be successful or not? Uh, because people don't typically want to sign up for a support group per se. You know, they just want to be part of their community and they want to be around. Everybody likes to be around like-minded mind, people. It lifts us up, no matter what our minds are like. You know, it, it doesn't. It it doesn't vary. Um, no, I, I'm going to go back to Dr. Cross and and just ask. You know, you've been doing this for five seasons now. Has there been anything in particular that has changed? Well, the basic program really hasn't changed at all. What has changed is how big our research team is. So our research team started as three people that I told you about, and as we started talking about it, more researchers on campus started knocking on our doors and saying, hey, we want to talk to you about what we do. So we had a faculty member from occupational therapy, Dr. Wendy Wood, come to us, and she said, oh, I have been doing this program. It's an equine-assisted therapy called Riding in the Moment, and we take people with dementia to... Um, this horse arena and they get to pet horses and groom them and potentially ride them if they're physically able and really want to. And so she had a whole framework about what enhanced engagement is for people living in residential treatment facilities. And so she joined our team so that we could think about her theories and how a variety of enriching programs uh, might be similar. Then we had a faculty member from the Interior Architecture and Design program join us. She has been, she wrote an article called um, Enriched Environments for the Healthy Aging Brain, and she's thinking specifically about visual stimulation and the design of interior environments and how they support liveliness and engagement. Um, and so we have a PhD student who uh, recently did her uh, research on this, and then we had a new faculty member join us from Communication Studies who does all of her research focused on um, care partners and dyads and relationships and how they demonstrate caring um, and support for each other. And then we let Dr. Tout left the music therapy program. We got a new person. And so we have a new music therapist, a junior faculty member, Lindsay Wilhelm. And so our team um, has just grown pretty much every single year since we first started doing it. And it's because this idea about how do we create enriching environments and those environments might be both the physical design of environments as well as the social and interactional, um, we're able to support healthy aging. So now we have a much more diverse team thinking about a variety of aspects uh, about how do we help people 
be healthy and smart in their aging lives. One thing I'd like to ask, because I, I don't think we covered this, um, was, how, you know, have the number of participants changed? You know, how many did you have initially, and then how many do you have now? The program has always had room for about 30 pairs. That's what we fundraise for every year. And the first year, I think we only had about 20 pairs, and that number's been steadily growing up. And now we... Um, are trying to recruit over 30 pairs each season because we buy those pairs of tickets, but we know that not everybody is going to come to every um, event. So we try to um, enroll a little bit closer to 40 pairs over the course of the season. And then we have people engaged in these other programs, the Writing in the Moment program. And then um, two years ago, we got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to expand this study to other environments. This was part of what the B-Sharp Steering Committee had always hoped that we could do some comparative studies of how the symphony experience might compare to theater or other arts performances. So we've been enlisting additional pairs um, in those studies. So I don't, have the, I don't have the perfect number off the top of my head, but I would say that our participation has probably doubled. It's probably doubled this year um, what it was the first year in people participating in the various programs. Amazing. Cindy, what do you have to add about what changes you've seen? Well, you know, we added looking at virtual reality uh, where one of the symphony performances and the reception ahead of time got filmed and then is used in with the virtual reality glasses. And Jenny, I'm not sure what the results of that are. Or I think it's still kind of in process, um, but you might know more about, about that. And then also, I think the study is interesting of how they're making people spit into containers now. <laughs> That's been the new, the new thing when they come to the reception. Okay, I so gotta hear about that one. one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so I'll talk about them both. Both of those are being headed up by our newest faculty member, Dr. Mira Fa. She got plugged into our team her second a month on campus, she talked to a research associate dean and he said, oh, hey, you should talk to them. So um, she has been leading the focus groups on virtual reality. And the big question about that is whether or not people will even be able to tolerate wearing the goggles and if it would make them dizzy. So the first experience was a really kind of far distant video recording and people were really not impressed. Then we got a much better recording that was closer up and people really liked it and wanted to engage with it. So the next step on that is really rendering that and taking it out to some places and seeing how people respond. You know, the great advantage of a virtual reality experience that includes the social component as well as getting to see part of the symphony is that then that could be taken to um, memory cafes or it could be taken to um, care facilities where people wouldn't have the don't have the ability to go out late at night or can't leave the facility so it could and also to take them to communities like in rural places where they really don't have access uh, to a symphony. So we're really thinking about it in terms of expanding the access of this kind of opportunity for people. So that's the, the virtual reality piece. So this past year, Dr. Fa received a grant to um, collect um, physiological markers. So we've been doing cognitive tests and interviews and asking people, you know, their perceptions, but we also are kind of interested in whether or not we can see physiological changes for people with dementia or their care partners. And um, so one of the technologies for doing this is looking at these things called telomeres, which are the ends of the DNA in our cells. And the telomeres kind of shorten as we age and they're actually fairly responsive to stressful events. And so our telomeres, when we're going under stress, could be shortening, and they also could be getting longer. And so the idea is to check people's telomere lengths at three times at the beginning of the season, in the middle, and then at the end. And so for the last about a year or so, Dr. Fa has been uh, asking people to spit in a cup so then we can send it to a lab on campus where they can look at telomeres and so this one, looking at um, these physiological changes in the body, is something that we're doing both for um, care partners and for people with dementia. So right now we have a PhD student who's really geeking out um, on the data, and he's um, 
running the samples and um, analyzing them. So we don't have any results from those yet, but we are uh, looking at them and we'll have a fairly large sample of um, people who have taken uh, spent in the cup multiple points in time so we can see their telomere changes, if there are any. That's going to be really interesting to, to yeah. collect that data. Um, mm -hmm. Wow. What, what um, Dr. Cross, have you been most surprised with with the study over the years? I think the most surprising was that first finding that we saw a cognitive improvement. I mean, I couldn't even convince scientists to join me on the research project at first because they said there's just no chance that you're going to see any positive change over a nine month period. And so I think that really stunned us. Another one of the really surprising findings is that we were in, and we, so we were thinking about the symphony as a therapeutic event. So you go to the symphony and we're thinking it probably should have an impact on your mood. It could potentially have an impact on your memory and also your attention, which is kind of your cognitive, uh, cognitive function kind of score. And <clears throat> the first thing we discovered about mood is the anticipatory effect of concerts. Most people described that they begin having a mood lift a few days before the concert, like maybe on Wednesday when concerts are on Saturday, because they're looking forward to it. Now, any normal person, if I told them this, like people anticipate stuff and they're happier beforehand, they would say, really, Dr. Cross, you needed a scientific study for people to tell you that mood is elevated before an event? <laughs> Talk about the science of the obvious, but we totally missed it. We actually didn't realize that the span on the mood is actually probably about a week, that uh, mood begins to lift on Wednesday or so before the concert as people anticipate it and think about their weekend. And then people's memory is better. We have people that are participating in their dementia is so advanced that they really can't remember what happened to them the day before. But when they go to the concert that next day, Sunday, and sometimes even Monday, they remember that they went to something that they really enjoyed or they remember that they went to the symphony. So even if they can't remember what the event was, they can talk with their partner and say, what did we do? I know we did something really fun. So that's kind of a, um, an interesting thing to me is how much mood seems to have an impact on memory and how big the window is around the mood lift. Well, and that just ties in perfect to the whole speckle program in terms of how, how does somebody feel? Um, right. So, it's all about feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes a ton of sense. It would be really, really interesting to do another study on people's doctor's appointments because they, that whole mood is, is spooky for a lot of them. And when, when do you tell somebody or even a sporadic event where this is, this is a regular event, there's a pattern of that feeling. But that unknown event, I think, would trigger, I, I wouldn't be surprised if both of those trigger more of a negative effect in terms of what they're anticipating um, for that. Because, it, you know, it's, I guess I've seen that with, with my own mom, and I've heard it from so many others in terms of, of timing. But when you have a, an enjoyable, pleasant, socially connected event, what, what great great outcomes with that. Cindy, how about you? Anything else that, that really surprised you with the study? You know, what surprised me initially, it still surprises me, is that a lot of people who are walking the dementia journey prefer daytime activities because it's harder at night. And so I, I was really concerned about it because the symphony doesn't start till 730 at night. And so we have people arrive at six and we have the reception and they do some of their assessments, but it, it doesn't get over till 10 o'clock at night. And I thought this is not going to work. Well, I'm shocked because they love to stay. I figured a lot of them would leave at intermission, um, get their assessments done and go. But I would probably, I would think Jenny, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of them stay for the whole thing. And that first couple of years, they wanted to actually continue the reception afterwards at 10 o'clock. And like this year, we're not doing that. I got to get home and sleep. <laughs> it's way too late for me. <laughs> but the participants, they don't seem to mind. And that actually surprised me. Well, you know, Cindy, that kind of reminds me when, when we did our cruise in 2017. 
and they got up early and they stayed up late and the rest of us were like uh, I, we weren't anticipating that but when i think when any of us feel that sense of community i mean think about it when you get together with your friends and you're having a good time you don't look at the clock you know, you are just in the moment and they're living in the moment. They're enjoying the moment. It feels good. And, you know, when you're in that zone, I think all of us just kind of get that energy boost. And so um, yet I think it surprises us because we think it should be different with a person with dementia. And what I love about this study is it's showing that we are so much more alike on so many levels in the importance of engagement, the importance of feeling purposeful and connected and having joy and, and, and just that sense of, I belong here. I'm welcomed here. Those are huge, huge flipping things that we overlook so often. And they're simple, but it's a basic need, I think, of of everybody to want to belong. And so when you find that niche, especially after you have because most people I think with dementia will say that they've experienced that sense of isolation and not belonging. So when you resurrect that, you don't wanna let that go, you know? Um, and, and I think when you have those moments, just like I, I think of when my mom would hold on to some moments and I'm like, out of all of the things that you could remember, you're gonna remember that, you know? But <laughs> she would hold on to it forever. And, and yet when there's a great moment, they hold on to that too. And, you know, there's so many more triggers to kind of resurrect that because you're, you know, we're touching both them and their care partners on multiple sensory levels. And, and I think it just is embedded and it's, it's easier to have those, those touch points. Dr. Cross, what do you think about that? No, I agree. I mean, the theory of human thriving isn't the theory of human thriving when you don't have dementia. It's the theory of human thriving. And so if we know that dementia has its challenges, let's also remember that all the things that contribute to thriving still contribute to thriving. And we can create programs that really support that uh, for everyone and encourage it. And if going to the symphony is more exciting to you when you're older in life and have uh, dementia than it was when you were younger, right? Like college students probably aren't looking forward to the symphony three days ahead of time, but if you have dementia and it does, well, great. Maybe the mood window is even bigger with dementia, which means that these impact, these pro types of programs that are planned to be social and normal and engaging people with existing community events. That's the big thing is that we're not creating new events for people with dementia. It's not a support group that happens to have music at it. It's just take people with dementia and make sure they feel safe and welcome at existing events. And um, there are all kinds of events that they can go to, including the um, equine therapy one, including theater, including dance, all kinds of things we could make more inviting and comfortable. Oh, this has just been such an exciting conversation. I just, I, I so appreciate both of you being with us. Um, one last question um, that I have for you, and I'm going to start with Dr. Cross on this. How do communities replicate this? How do we, how do we get this to spread? So how do other communities replicate it? This is, has been a big challenge for us. It's not a challenge in our community because we have a big partnership for age-friendly communities. We have a very collaborative community. We really have the capacity to lift programs like this off the ground. The real challenge we've seen in other places is that this program, we have to raise all the money for the tickets, which we don't have any trouble doing each year, and that's several thousand dollars. Um, the bigger issue is um, organizations being willing to give their employees the time to dedicate to doing this. So in our community, the steering committee meets once a month and we plan and talk about how the last concert went and what changes we need to make for the next one and how recruitment is going and how people are responding and what's happening with research. And other communities that have wanted to do this struggle with that. They don't have someone who, like we have the person who, who works at the adult day program, has just enfolded this um, 
participant recruitment and management and the reminder phone calls that go out to everybody saying, hey, the program's happening. So that's kind of a basic project program management role. That role, Banner Health allows that person to just put that in their job and it's part of the hours they do for their job. But other communities have said they wanna do it and they don't have people either with those roles in the community or the organizations that are supporting those people aren't willing to let people spend that time. So one of the things I study are community collaborations and this is something I see over and over again is that the way to build new things and to build capacity is not to create new jobs or to create a new person. It's for organizations to improve their willingness to let their people dedicate their time and a limited amount, you know, it's a fixed number of hours that anybody spends on supporting the B-Sharp program, but just saying, you can do this as part of your job because building this program is good for our community. I, I would add on to that too. Um, I, I think that, um, and, and I feel really strongly on this, it's not about the job title, it's about a person with passion entering that group. And so it might not be somebody who you would expect to want to step into that role, but opening it up so that we get the right matches because I see that all over the country where people think they have to have certain organizations or they have to have certain positions. And when those entities don't want to be in the group, oh man, they can drag it down and, and you know punch out the, the spark in two seconds. And it really, I think that's one of the things Cindy's been so good at in terms of her job is you know, aligning with people that get it, that want it, and and then they just, you know, they open up on so many levels, and I really think organizations have to start embracing that. We are in a time where budgets are tight, staff retention is low, and, and allowing an employee to be, to participate in something like this gives them purpose, gives them a reason you know, helps retain them in their position when jobs are flipping like pancakes out there. You know, we have to be much broad, much more broad-minded in terms of what a role is and understanding that, you know, we all play multiple roles in life and that doesn't change. You know, we're, we're moms and daughters and sisters and cousins and friends and you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And if we don't start looking at our employees and our organizations as multi-level beings, I think we're hurting ourselves as a whole. Cindy, what are your thoughts? Oh, I couldn't, ag I couldn't agree with you more. I, that is what will give people job satisfaction if they feel like what they're doing matters. And again, this whole idea of collaboration in our community, I, I, I keep going back to that African proverb of if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And we really are doing it together, which is, I think, what's keeping us going and expanding our reach. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's all about working together and helping people find their passion and, and purpose in what, what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and allowing them to be creative and come up with ideas because none of us, none of us have all the answers. And I, again, I think that's a huge mistake when we think we got it down because the needs are constantly changing. The groups that are supporting these types of initiatives changes, you know, just like you said, Dr. Cross, one person left, another one stepped in and hey, they got this whole idea. And how cool is that? So that energy level just keeps going. And when someone because all of us play multi-roles and there's times where I know when I'm on committees, it's like, I just, I got to back up or, or I'm going to crack and break and that would not be good. you know. And, and then others, you know, pick up and lift and, you know, we do that for one another. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of building unity through community. And I think you guys have just done an exceptional job with that. I'm just going to ask if you have any um, last comments, Dr. Cross. Yeah, so I would just say, you know, like I was, when it's a program that's worth doing, and any community organized program like this is worth doing, you know, it's worth just being tenacious, and I didn't accept those faculty members who said, no, I don't think this is interesting. I just kept looking for other people who wanted to join me, because I knew I didn't have all the tools to do this research and the same goes for our community partners right that 
um, we can do really great things together. And there are really specific rules that you need to have filled in a program like this to make it happen, but there's no magic bullet about who those people are that do it. Not every community is going to have dementia-friendly communities. Not every community is going to have an adult day program that wants to give up their staff time, but there are champions and people who are passionate and excited in every community and any community can create a program like this whether you have a symphony or not there's live music in every single community and creating a happy joyful event that people are brought to that's not a special event created for people with dementia that's just a place that's made safe and inviting um, is something that any community could replicate. Wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time. Cindy, how about you? Any last thoughts? Yeah, I would just say anybody who's wanting to replicate a program like this is just to really be on the lookout and surround yourself with people who are what if visionary thinkers, like what if we did this and what if we did that? And maybe they don't all come true, but boy, if you don't surround yourself with people who are energizing like that, nothing's going to get done. And so you just kind of like the Wisconsin model of uh, building dementia-friendly communities. Start somewhere and then just evolve as you go, but don't be afraid to start. Everything doesn't have to be in order and all the players don't have to be in place for you to at least start and try. Yeah, my saying is it's not about perfection, it's about progress and knowing that no matter where you are, we can always do better, always. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, one of the things that you um, had said, too, I can't remember if it was Dr. Cross or you, but, you know, aligning with liked mind people, you know, that is one of the things that came across in your talk, um, how appreciative and, you know, what great effects that had on the people participating in the program is you brought liked mind people together that all believe that life can be good with dementia. And on top of it, you're proving stati with statistical backing and research that it is working and it can be done. And um, I, I think with these dementia-friendly communities, it's the same thing. You know, you, you hear a no, move on. That's not the person you're supposed to be working with. You know, there, there's somebody else out there, but looking for the like to mind people is fine. But I, I, I personally believe it's more than just having an eye open. It's about having the courage to talk about it. It's, it's about, and you're going to get some people that look at you crazy. And again, they're just not your people. And then you're going to get those others where when Cindy was talking about it, just the spark in the eye, you know, and you just know instantly. And it's so energizing to, to gather those people together, to have more great ideas to um, to do than what you have what you can actually do to end up having that parking lot and going okay let's pick let's pick and we know we'll get to these other ones but right now what's our priority and uh, to me that is just so exciting to know that there's so much out there that can be done and then to um, be able to feed other people through through your energy and through mentoring and through sharing your stories like you guys did today to believe that there are other ways you know to approach life with dementia so thank you so much um, we do have the contact information for both um, Cindy and Dr. Cross and you know feel free to to reach out to both and they also have some some tips for the dementia friendly um, research tips for the B Sharp Arts Engagement Program. We'll post that so you have that. And Dr. Cross, if you get me um, the latest update, we will post that as well. But I am I am so grateful and so thankful for your time and energy. What a huge difference. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. We are just really privileged to be in this community where people are willing to think creatively and work together to make community a better place. I think most communities are like that, but it takes somebody to kind of ignite it and coordinate it and start it. I, I think, I, I really do believe most communities want to be that community. We need creative minds like you guys. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.